On January 20th, 1981, actor and politician Ronald Wilson Reagan was inaugurated as the 40th President of the United States. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help me God. With this endowment, the US people wanted to leave behind the 70s, a decade full of problems. The price of oil went sky high, inflation, political scandals like Watergate increased unemployment. Their influence reduced around the planet in favour of the Soviet Union, powerless before escalating armed conflicts. The Iranian Revolution, the Iran-Iraq War, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the Sandinista Revolution in their own backyard. To meet the American expectations in his administration, Reagan sought a conservative political reform in a liberal economic sphere. Moreover, a change of policy on foreign affairs to a more intrusive and confrontational one with respect to the Soviet Union. The main objectives of this reform were, in the first stage, implement an extreme free commerce known as neoliberalism in the US economy. Reduce the size of the states to transform it to only a fair deliverer of public justice. Deregulate the financial market, labour and environmental flexibility. Increase the defence budget as support for the implementation of the second stages reform. The spread of neoliberalism on an international level. These objectives had to negotiate one obstacle. The New Deal, which had provided many benefits for over 30 years, now was the enemy of the state. In early 1981, Reagan found a favourable climate for the reforms he had in mind. 69 days after his inauguration, Reagan suffered an attack at the hands of a man who considered himself to be Robert De Niro in Taxi Driver. Good economic times joined with this incident and gave Reagan the last boost he needed. He took advantage of the coverage and publicity that the media offered. Thanks to the attack, he accomplished to divert attention and leave in the background the most unpopular reforms that he had been approved. In August 1981, air traffic controllers went on strike, demanding better salaries and better hours. Reagan declared the strike illegal and fired 12,000 of the 13,000 controllers that were on strike. They are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. 1982 did not differ much from the previous year. The economic outlook and social conditions in North America did not improve. Unemployment had increased double digits to 9.7% and the GDP shrank to minus 1.9. 1983 was the year prior to the elections and Reagan knew that he needed re-election to complete the series of reforms required for the implementation of neoliberalism in the United States. Also to begin expanding the economic model of the School of Chicago abroad. On March 8th, Reagan called the Soviet Union the evil empire. To ignore the facts of history and the aggressive impulses of an evil empire, to simply call the arms race a giant misunderstanding, and thereby remove yourself from the struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. They are the focus of evil in the modern world. The 27th of the same month, he announced the start of a strategic defense system known as the Star Wars program. With these declarations, the Reagan administration managed to start the second stage of its agenda, implementing the free market as the only global economic system. On October 23rd, 1983, the United States invades Granada. 1984 was the year for the presidential elections. On August 11th, unaware that his microphone was on, Reagan announced. My fellow Americans, I'm pleased to tell you today that I've signed legislation that will outlaw Russia forever. We begin bombing in five minutes. Two days before beginning on the Republican National Convention to confirm Ronald Reagan as a candidate for the November election, an article was published in the Washington Post that would change the perception we had of the three preceding years. The article was entitled MPOs. Thanks. The journalist who wrote the article, Mr. Aaron W. Jefferson, stated that, 
in February 1981, the Reagan administration had received a report from the CIA detailing the current state of national security, also short and long-term projections in the same subject. In the section on internal security, the report anticipated that social unrest would grow at rates of two digits in the next five years, bringing riots, protests and demonstrations against economic and social reforms. There's no doubt about the existence of the CIA report in Order 1073. What is in doubt, at least in the minds of some people, is, is what the content of those documents was. But it was nothing out of the ordinary, and it didn't have the connotation Jefferson had given to it in the article. The CIA prepares and submits a status report to the nation on matters related to national security for all incoming administrations to the White House and for the National Security Committee. This was the report of which the article was speaking, and there was nothing dark about it. The report was discussed at a regular meeting by the committee, and it was decided that it was unlikely that the predictions made by the CIA would occur. Uh, Iran, Afghanistan, Nicaragua, and, and the Soviet Union. These subjects were much more pressing. The National Security Committee, concerned with the problems from overseas, dismissed the CIA report. Listen, unless transformed into subversive and, and destabilizing actions, it was not imperative for the Committee for Homeland Security. Uh, perhaps for a, a political committee, there would be more concern as to the political cost, uh, excuse the redundancy, but maybe it would be a more pressing subject. Uh, but since the report came to us, it, it was just not considered significant. Well, I found the article. I was home, and a friend of mine called and said, hey, the Washington Post just published an article about a conspiracy against the MPOs. Man, you got to read it. You're going to freak. So I did. I bought the paper, read the article, and to tell you the truth, uh, I was fucking surprised. It clarified a lot of things that were happening in the organization. The first time neoliberalism was introduced was in Indonesia under the dictatorship of General Suharto. In the first months, Suharto had killed half a million citizens and initiated disappearances, a state of siege and a curfew. These were the tools that accompanied everyday economic reforms and employment and that were implanted into the environment in Indonesia. The second time the economic theories of the Chicago school saw light of day was in Chile in 1973 under the dictatorship of General Pinochet, which was also accompanied by a railway of repression, killings and disappearances. It was the United States that for the first time tried to implement neoliberalism in an economy without a disproportionate use of force. The Reagan administration knew the American people were not Indonesian or Chilean people. They needed another way to placate the discontent that the reforms they were considering would provoke no deaths or mass disappearances. It needed surgical treatment. With that in mind, the Reagan administration sent Order 1073. This order asked the CIA to formulate preventive plans to prevent the possible social unrest, short and long term, taking into account the reform program that the administration would implement. To get an idea of their contents, you have to understand the uh, general mood of the country uh, during the 80s, the early 80s. Uh, you know uh, what the, the average citizen's reaction to the Reagan uh, reforms were and what, what they were worried about in general. We were at a historical tipping point. Uh, the people were beginning to realize that the, the life they had known and and had enjoyed was fading away before their very eyes and that the American dream was becoming more of a nightmare. The deteriorating purchasing power of the American middle class, a result of the reforms in the labor and economic laws made it impossible to maintain the lifestyle of the previous generation. One could no longer provide for a household with a single income as it had been for decades. Decades after the Second World War, a family of middle-class workers could afford the mortgage on their house with their salary. Now they could not make ends meet with two jobs or the contribution of another family member. By the time uh, Reagan took over as president, things had temporarily calmed down. 
uh, people were anxious to see what this new conservative government, uh, the new administration, was going to do uh, to turn things around for them. Also, Carter's attempt to appease voters through the injection of money into the economy in the lead up to the 1980 elections unwittingly created some uh, economic breathing room for the Republicans. Now, while these two uh, factors help lead to a momentary, what should we say, fragile tranquility in, on the American uh, political scene, underneath the surface, Reagan knew how hard it was going to be to implement uh, the reforms that he and his party thought uh, were so crucial uh, for the country. Um, without, of course, creating a significant political backlash from the left. Now, if you consider just these two factors, it becomes obvious that the order submitted by the Reagan administration would reflect at least some concern about the CIA forecast. I believe that under the prevailing climate at the end of the Carter administration, there was some discontent. Don't forget that inflation stood at 10% and unemployment at around 8%. But was this discontent big enough to worry the CIA and in turn to worry the Reagan administration? I think not. As to whether the discontent could rise because of the reforms that were part of Reagan's administration, history tells us otherwise because the dissatisfaction decreased. The CIA sent, in response to Order 1073, an elaborate guideline by the Office of Intelligence and Analysis. A guideline is a plan of action developed to solve problems, unify criteria, and establish procedural methods towards um, a framework of national security. According to Jefferson's article, the CIA's plans embodied in the guideline were a. Select a handful of less radical organizations and help their expansion and development in order to make them easier to control. Renewal and minimization of social pressure b. Harass other organisations to prevent expansion and maintenance to a state of insignificance. c. Cancel the leadership of the more radical leaders of these organisations, giving way to those that are more suited to the plans of this administration. d. Infiltrate these organisations in search of partial or total control, short and long term. Reagan gave the order to implement the guideline of Order 1073, June 20, 1981. Well, the report, Order 1073, and the guidelines were all completely censored for national security purposes. However, Jefferson's notes contain an interview uh, conducted with a CIA agent who was directly involved with uh, the preparatory phase of the guidelines. Obviously, uh, we know the documents existed, but we would not have known what was said in them if it were not uh, for the interview. The interview is the key. It's the only source uh, that reveals the contents of those documents. One cannot open a sealed CIA report simply because of a report in the newspaper. There has to be something more transcendent with greater weight to withdraw the seal. An article in the paper certainly does not have the significance or weight necessary. I only participated in part of the operation also, if I were to answer your question, uh, the agency would have no trouble identifying me. What I can talk about is the CIA in general, this guideline specifically, and in general terms. I think Mr. Jefferson's theory is interesting, but as a historian, my scope is limited to verifiable facts, something you cannot easily do with explicit theories in his article. The source was never revealed the supposed CIA agent who uncovered this plot. Therefore, it's a difficult theory to prove. Um, for reasons of security and information, the more delicate missions are basically split. That means that the Secret Service will provide only the necessary information to each agent for them to complete their mission as mandated. So no one agent has knowledge of the operation overall. They only know a part of the story. In this case, for example, a team of agents could have been formed to infiltrate carefully selected NPOs. 
but no one agent needed to know the existence of any of the other agents involved in the mission. Uh, what I know about the particular guideline is what I read in the Washington Post article. Uh, that was when I learned about the missing pieces of the puzzle. And they fit perfectly. It was a magnificent plan. 100% CIA. What did the article say? It said that the uh, Republicans had selected a, a handful of the more or less radical NGOs. And uh, the beginning in 1981, these organizations began to have a rapid growth in both money and influence. And this growth was not consistent with the history of their growth up to that time. This growth became even more evident as the 1984 presidential elections approached, as uh, was clearly pointed out in the article. Uh, another suspicious fact is that if you compare the number of arrests of NGO activists with the number of demonstrations that took place before and after 1981, you can see that the number of demonstrations increased substantially, but were more peaceful in nature, and that the number of arrests declined enormously. Now, how can this be, particularly considering that the Reagan administration was much more concerned about keeping their image as the law and order party in contrast to the Carter administration's perceived weakness in dealing with civil unrest. Obviously, divide and conquer is a maxim older than the Roman Empire. But that that division was caused by the Reagan administration or by the CIA, I don't think so. For me, it was a social phenomenon. The current individualism that you see everywhere, work, leisure, intellectually, and it's this individualism that makes people lean according to their motivations. And therefore, they divide increasingly into organizations compatible with their beliefs and principles. In the early 80s, a change became apparent in the way people protested. There were no longer mass demonstrations as in previous decades. The percentages of arrests decreased. The amount of congregated people reduced drastically. There were more demonstrations, but smaller and more peaceful. We totally changed uh, the way we carried out our objectives as an organization fighting for the environment. All of a sudden, the methods we had used, you know, in a civil rights demonstrations against the Vietnam War, late 60s, 70s, were no longer valid. I still don't understand why. New leaders of various NGOs are more inclined to peaceful means to show social unrest and the claims to which they aspired. In 1985, we met in Brussels, Americans and Europeans, to talk and take a decision about any initiative regarding the naval blockade the Nicaragua was suffering from the United States. Reagan and his administration had been hostile to the Sandinista regime since entering the White House. They were considered a threat for the entire region in an effort to export the revolution. On November 23, 1981, they put into effective a sea blockade and began to harass Nicaragua. They blocked the ports and the U.S. aircrafts burst into Nicaraguan air territory. On November 3, 1986, the General Assembly of the United Nations issued a resolution calling the United States to end the blockade. The U.S. position was to maintain all this on a judicial level. They never backed off from this position. We tried by all means to persuade them that it was of the utmost importance that they would make it known what their government was doing in Nicaragua. The pressure of public opinion has always been one of the best arms when initiating a struggle against the government. The Americans didn't have the faintest clue of the naval blockade, nor the harassment Nicaragua was suffering at the hands of the government. On June 27, 1986, the court in The Hague ruled in favor of Nicaragua and called for the cessation immediately of the blockade and incursions by United States. The ruling in favor of Nicaragua went uh, completely unnoticed in the United States. It was impossible to reach a decision with them. The United States of America ignores the judgment and the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. The US Ambassador at the Union Nations, Jean Kirkpatrick, dismissed the court as a semi-legal, semi-juridical, semi-political body, which nations sometimes accept and sometimes do not. Now we arrive at the stickiest part of this case, the, 
the elimination of the most uh, committed and radical uh, activist leadership. What happened to them? They, they seem to have vanished into to thin air. A, a high percentage of them were mysteriously unable to find work. Uh, all of a sudden they were persona non grata. It, it was almost like an unlucky mantle had been placed over them. Annulling an individual is to make them lose all capacity for leadership to act as a hostile agent to the interests of the nation. We, we seek weakness, pedophilia, homosexuality, any perversion, financial or family problems, anything to discredit them as a person and to undermine their credibility. Well, you look back and you realize that the vast majority of leaders who built the Green Revolution are no longer in the organizations they founded. How can it be that the leaders vanish like that? They were in the prime of their lives. I think that these activists, formed most of the time of Vietnam War and the struggle for civil rights, ran their course and naturally made room for a new generation. They were more motivated than anybody. They really believed they had to mobilize the people, that these problems were fucking serious, man. If we find nothing in the dark of their private life and we cannot make it up, then it moves to a more drastic phase. An accidental death, an ordinary mugging, a fall off a ladder, a car accident, or a disappearance. Peter McClearson uh, died of suspicious circumstances. He, he was electrocuted by his electric razor. You tell me, who in the hell is electrocuted by their ra a razor? Uh, a Alexander Allen, his, his car ran into the river. Uh, Manfred Guzman was hit by a Cleveland City Council truck. Of course, it was never known who was driving the truck because there was a fire in the archives of the logistics service and all the driver's records were lost. And when none of these options are possible because the individual is well known and an accidental death or a disappearance would certainly lead to uh, an investigation difficult to avoid or cover up, then we opted for a process called psychological regression. Or What does that mean? Regression. Um, psychological regression is basically to return an individual to a pre-verbal child state. I'm sorry, how did I do that? Well, there's a handbook for it. There's a handbook? Yes, it's called the Kubark Manual. It outlines in detail how to fully exploit uncooperative human resources. But when applied in its full extent, the procedure culminates in psychological regression. In the 60s, a doctor of psychiatry from the University of Toronto, Ewan Cameron, completed a study funded by the CIA that was intended to leave a person's memory blank. Cameron claimed that to cause this reset was necessary to break down mentally acquired personality. The method required to achieve that goal was to put the individual in total isolation, depriving him of the senses, sight, touch, hearing, and in addition, deal him a heavy electroshock treatment. The result of this study was the Kubark Manual of Human Resources Handling, which details the ways to proceed with a detainee during the interrogation to obtain their complete submission. This manual was the guide of the military coups in South America, Vietnam, and Africa. After a few weeks of the treatment, um, this person undergoes psychological regression, acquiring in the earliest aftermath the behavior of a child, thumb sucking, the fetal position constantly, urinary and fecal incontinence, and loss of verbal skills. They can't put a sentence together. Uh, in the long term, there is memory loss. Marcel Logan left a note saying he was going camping for a couple of days. He surfaced two months later in, in the most pitiful state of mind you can imagine. He, he still has trouble organizing a complete thought. In the first few days, he had problems controlling his bowels. Um, 
he, I don't know why, but he would put himself into the fetal position. And he, he just didn't speak. He, he didn't talk to anyone. For such people, drug consumption was normal. It's not astonishing that some of them have mental problems. Um, uh, he's doing a lot better. Um, the worst part is the nightmares. He also confuses dates, people, memories. The capacity loss is only the first symptom. After a time, they recover some of their abilities, but never 100%. In addition, there's no going back. These are people that have been shown to be socially unbalanced. They have lost all their credibility, and nobody trusts what they say. It all happened uh, slowly but surely. An accidental death case of insanity, disappearances, suicides, disrepute. All this in five or six years. How could it happen? I gotta believe the article. We could name a dozen people who for various reasons have moved away from the stronger activist movements. The people most committed to the fight. There are too many coincidences with the guidelines. Margaret Thatcher, publicly self-declared admirer of the policies of Ronald Reagan, and also a conservative, in 1984 lists the striking miners as internal enemies, and even states in the House of Commons of the United Kingdom Executive Secretary of the Coal Miners Union was an M15 agent put there to destabilize and sabotage the organization. Do you think that the NPOs could be infiltrated by the CIA now? To believe that, I would have to believe that the contents of the CIA guidelines were those that attributed to it by Mr. Jefferson in his article, which is something I do not believe. The uh, agents are not infiltrating one thing exclusively. They're working on several fronts. They just lend more importance to certain things at certain times, but nothing more. The CIA has other functions. It's unthinkable that they devote people to infiltrate organizations that offer no real threats to national security. It's such a disproportionate effort for the minimum level of risk that these organizations could cause. This is easier than you might think. The CIA has agents everywhere. For example, an undercover agent in a bank, in a foreign company, in an American company. The agent is brought in. We want you to join an organization. These are the objectives, this is what you have to do, and this is the way you have to act. That's all. And the credibility of the agent is enhanced by having him arrested a couple of times, or by providing him inside information to help him win the small battles. The people that were moving up and becoming leaders of these organizations didn't have a fucking clue about ecological problems. Soon, he's at the top of the organization. The hierarchy of any organization is easy to reach, with the right support. And the CIA is the best backing anyone could have anywhere in the world. Do you think there are CIA agents in Timor, Trinidad, Tobago, Lesotho? If there are embassies there, then it's certain there are CIA agents in those countries. Now Greenpeace has more members than these countries have citizens. And Greenpeace raises more money than these countries have in their entire budgets. And Greenpeace members have a higher level of education than the citizens of these countries. Isn't that true? Yes, that's right. But there are no CIA agents in Greenpeace. It's unthinkable. But the countries I just named. Yes, but the strategic value of a country, however small, is greater than that of any organization. When a person has worked for the Department of Intelligence or Counterintelligence of whatever country, they see things differently. And there comes a time when they don't know what to believe. What's your opinion about the rumor circulating around Aaron W. Jefferson's death? First of all, any death is regrettable. And my heart goes out to the people that knew Mr. Jefferson. But I have an obligation to say that he had a somewhat paranoid way of thinking. His friends thought along the same lines as he did. That said, it doesn't surprise me they believe he was assassinated. It is an insult to the intelligence of the people that knew Aaron. He would never commit suicide. How in the world do you explain that, that he waited three years to publish his article in order to make sure 
that the information his CIA source gave him uh, concurred with the guideline. And after all this work, he goes out into the middle of the woods three days after it's published and shoots himself in the head. The real question is, who benefited from Jefferson's death? They found powder residue on Jefferson's hand, proving that he fired a gun. There were no signs of a struggle on his body or in his house. Nor did anyone see a suspect. It appears he suffered from severe depression and chose suicide. It's a shame, but it's a fact. For my part, I try not to wrap my mind about it, and I know the best you can have is an approximation to the truth of the events. Therefore, when I read the newspaper or watch television, um, and something catches my eye, I wonder, is, is anyone benefited or burdened by this? And if the answer is no, then I consider that the news is true. On the contrary, I realize that someone has an interest in the matter. And then I can see a hand, very similar to mine, that has been involved in the matter. Do you share the opinion that with Jefferson's death died the only way to prove what the article said? No. One could also interview the CIA agent who interviewed Jefferson in 1981. If we rely on assumptions, if we judge based on assumptions, then there are lots of interpretations possible in a case like this. That's why I don't base judgments on facts that are not verified. Fellas, we're making a documentary. Exactly what you're doing here, Mr. Kowalski. Would you care to come with us, please? What's this all about? I'll ask you again. Would you care to come with us, please? Who are you? I don't know what this is all about. John, John, John. Don't make this more difficult than it has to be. Listen, I know my rights. You can't just come in here and not tell Jimmy, me who you are. Camera, please. Thank you. No, listen, Jimmy, I'll get the camera, all right? The camera's not a... Listen, if that camera gets broken, you're going to hear from my lawyer about this. 